Good morning, my friends, and happy Sunday. Welcome back to The Criminal Spud, where we chat about some true crime cases in a short and informal way. The content covered may be upsetting or even disturbing at times. So look, if this is not your jam, or if you're just not in the headspace today, then that is okay. By all means, go ahead and press skip. But do stop by my main channel, The Sofa Spud Reviews, for something lighter and much less stabby. Now, if you do enjoy this kind of content, go ahead and let me know by liking and subscribing so that I know whether or not to make more videos like this one. Now, as some of you might already know, this is our second case of our Dublin-based Double Bill Weekend. So yesterday we talked about the Mulhall sisters, sometimes commonly referred to as the Scissor Sisters. Don't get me started. Ridiculous name. And today we have another murder case. I mean, spoiler alert, <laughs> they're all murder cases. And today's story takes place only three years after the Mulhall case. It happens in 2008 and it's also, of course, in Dublin, which is a very small place. So if you're not from Dublin, you've never been to Dublin, you could pretty much drive from the north to the south of Dublin, like through the entire county in 30 minutes, you know, if there was no traffic on the road. It, it's that small. So yeah, these two stories presented a really interesting side by side. Like yesterday, we were looking at the Mulhalls. We talked about a really tough upbringing, a tough family environment. There was generational drug and alcohol issues and they didn't have a pot to piss in because nobody worked unless they were on a street corner or committing petty crimes. So it can be very easy for some folks to look at people like the Mulhalls and kind of dismiss them as, you know, never having stood a chance. Like, would they really ever have had a chance of turning out differently? So today we're going to look at how the other half live in Dublin and how the other half murder. So without further ado, let's talk about the case of Eamon Lillis and Celine Cawley. Now some of you may recognise these names. This case was referenced in conversation with me recently. And it was very funny because I hadn't thought about these guys in years. I instantly recognised the names. I knew exactly the case that they were talking about and I knew the outcome and kind of what happened but I still found myself thinking wait what actually happened there again because there were so many different versions swirling around at the time it was hard to keep up and the newspapers it was basically their wet dream they could not get enough of covering this story when it happened we are no strangers to murder here in Dublin for such a small place yes it, it can be at times a little bit grisly however this was different this was you know rich people murder it happened in Hoth Pearl Clutch Hoth is this super wealthy area it's a gorgeous area it's a really you know tourist kind of spot if you go there on a sunny day there's there's nothing like it you know you get attacked by seagulls if you have food in your hand. There's never any parking. You will actually run out of petrol trying to just find a parking spot. And that's not a word of a lie. That's actually happened to me on two occasions. And apart from the main kind of hustle and bustle, the village that's right down by the harbour and the marina, there's all these lovely restaurants and fresh fishmongers. There's a beach. There's yeah, it's just, there's a lot to offer. And then up in the hills, there are these massive homes, these really super expensive homes. Now they range anywhere from like under a mill right up to, there was one that went up there last year for, they were looking for like 20 million. Uh, now it came with a lot of land. <laughs> it was a beautiful home, but that kind of gives you an idea of the type of wealth that is nestled away up in those hills behind those perfectly manicured hedges and trees. And the biggest houses up there, you probably don't even know are there because they are so nestled away and they are so private. They're far away from the prying eyes of, you know, peasants like you and I. But go on to Google Earth and just have a little, you know, aerial view over Hoth and you'll get an idea of what kind of houses there really are up there. But this is where Eamon and Celine lived. So Eamon and Celine were a married couple. And in 2008, when our story takes place, Celine was 46 and Eamon, I believe, was 50 or 51. And they'd been married for like 17 years at this stage. So things weren't exactly, you know, honeymoon period central, but it still functioned. They still got on quite well. And they had one child together. They had a teenager called Georgia. I think she was about 16 or 17 around this time. And she was still in school. 
and they lived in a place called Windgate, which was worth about three million at the time. So it was a beautiful, beautiful home. Now it has been renovated and changed and the name of the home is changed to something else now because yeah, they're basically trying to erase what happened in this home, which we'll get to now. But what I'm trying to say is they had quite a nice little life. And Celine was born in Bredenhout. Like she grew up there. Her family were always from there. So they had money. Let's just say that they were a family of really well-known and really well-accomplished solicitors. Celine had kind of gone and done her degree in UCD. And actually so had Eamon, but they didn't know each other in college. Just, you know, they were a couple of years apart. But they both went to UCD, which is one of the most expensive colleges in the country. Now it's absolutely excellent, but it's one of the most expensive colleges in the country. And Celine, in her younger years, she'd gone off to the States. I think she lived in New York for a while. She signed with Elite Model Management and she did some campaigns for some really well-known brands. But she eventually came back to Ireland and she got straight down to business and she got into production. So she started her own company, which was called Toy Town Productions. And basically, Toy Town Productions was was advertising and I don't just mean kind of you know second rate advertising like Lisa Rinna in adult diapers I mean big name brand advertising so they dealt with Guinness Coca-Cola Carlsberg they did like our domestic national lottery which you know that's a really big deal (laughs) it's a really big deal McDonald's like their kind of ads that circulated so top tier kind of brand names there and she had so many contacts through her family and through her time kind of working in modeling she even had done a really small kind of appearance I won't even call it a role it was like a non-speaking extra type role in one of the old Bond movies so she did have a little bit of clout I mean I don't think the Bond thing was as big a deal as the media blew it up into like they were literally referring to her on the cover of all the newspapers at the time as you know Bond girl and it's not that I'm trying to downplay that and be some kind of a hater I just think that Celine had accomplished so much more than that very small moment in a Bond movie and yeah she did much bigger and better things than that so anyway getting back to it so she had started this Toy Town Productions company and it was doing excellently as you can imagine and Eamon you know he was more of a creative type as well he had wanted to write some novels and do his own kind of thing but he just didn't really have the same drive or the same ability or the same kind of network as Celine so he kind of just took a role in the company like I say Celine's company they were 50 50 shareholders he just took a role in the company And he took a a salary. Now, it was nowhere near the kind of money that Celine was raking in. So they were earning about 600 grand a year between them. But Celine was bringing in about 500 grand of that. So, yeah, there was a bit of a financial imbalance, shall we say. But look, they held everything jointly. They were a married couple. They were together since 1991. So, of course, you know, the house was held jointly. It's not as if everything was just in Celine's name. So we get to Monday the 15th of December 2008. It is the start of the final week before Christmas. Everybody is going to be finishing up for the holidays and by all accounts it's just a normal Monday morning. So Eamon gets up and drops Georgia to school and then Selena's doing something around the house so he kind of takes the dogs out for a walk and he goes to the local corner shop to buy his newspaper. And they're not going to be in the office really that day. They have some meetings at lunchtime and then they might go in later on. But as I said, it's the last week leading up to the Christmas break. And as you can imagine, given that their company's business is advertising for big brands like Coca-Cola and Guinness, their work is pretty much done. Their busy season is over because Christmas ads are a big deal. So everything's already kind of gone to air. It's probably been replaying on a loop on every television around the country for the last month. So it's really just kind of chill time now before the new year starts and they have to do it all over again. So as I said, Eamon's off down to the corner shop to pick up his newspaper and Celine is at home doing a few bits around the house. So he comes back from his walk he lets the dogs off their harnesses and they're starting to bark and go crazy and he goes into the kitchen and he looks out the window onto their patio that they have and he sees that Celine 
is on the ground on the patio in a pool of blood with an intruder standing over her holding a brick in his hand. And Eamon, seeing this, he runs outside to confront this intruder and make sure Celine is okay. And the intruder strikes him in the face with this brick. And then he makes off, you know, across their rolling gardens and over the fence through a neighbour's. Now, I don't feel like I sold that very convincingly. And that is because Eamon didn't either. So just about 10 a.m., Emergency services get a frantic phone call from Eamon Lillis and he is panting on the other end of the line. He's telling them that his wife is unresponsive. There's blood everywhere. She's been attacked by an intruder and he's been attacked as well. He's sustained injuries, but, you know, she's not breathing. She's not responding. She's not opening her eyes. She's just lying there in blood and he doesn't know what to do. So they kind of guide him through CPR. They can hear the dogs going crazy in the background and the ambulance actually arrives on scene very, very quickly. And they bring Celine to the hospital. She is still alive, but about an hour later, she is pronounced dead at the hospital. And Eamon receives, you know, just minor treatment from the doctors as well for his injuries, which are relatively superficial. He's got scratches on his face. He's got a you know, a busted up finger and he does have a big lump, like contusion type lump over his eye where he says that he was struck by this brick and they're going to get a change of clothes there for Eamon because number one, he's covered in blood, but number two, they're going to need to bag all of the clothing that he's wearing as evidence because they're going to need to analyse it and see, you know, he was attacked by this guy. Is there any kind of evidence on his clothing that can help us find this um, perpetrator? And Eamon's going into the bathroom and they remind him also, you know, you got into this tussle with this intruder. So just make sure you don't wash your hands. And Eamon says, oh, well, I've already actually washed my hands, you know, back at the house, which That's a strange thing to do if you're in a crisis, you've walked in on the scene that I've just described and you're doing CPR, your wife is completely non-responsive and you're having her rush to a hospital to try and save her life. I don't think washing my hands would be anywhere on my agenda, but that was but a minor red flag. There are many bigger ones to come. So they bag up all of the clothes that he came into the hospital wearing and they've treated his his injuries. And of course, as I mentioned, Celine unfortunately is pronounced dead. So he then notifies the company, the employees that are in the office, and he has to have Georgia's school notified and someone has to be sent to, you know, go and get Georgia because she's going to have to be brought into the police station. She's obviously not going to be able to go back to that house when she finishes school because remember, it's a Monday, she's in school, she's not to know what is going on right now. And Eamon is starting to be kind of interviewed for the first time in the afternoon around four o'clock. And they're really trying to get him to go through any detail that he can possibly remember. Like he's obviously very distressed and he's in shock what's just happened today. But it's so important that they get any detail that he can give them because this is no longer just, you know, a home kind of burglary situation. This is now a murder investigation. So they need to find this person. And Eamon kind of recounts what happened. So as I described, he came home. Celine was outside on the patio. She was on the ground. She was covered in blood. There was an intruder in literally like, you know, a ski mask and a black top and black gloves. And he might as well have described the Hamburglar. It was exactly what you'd imagine an intruder to look like per his description. And at this point, Eamon actually gives the name of a local man. He mentions that they had been burgled previously And this is where he brings up the name of the man. Now, I don't know if this man was actually proven to have burgled them before, or maybe they suspected that this man, you know, had been the one to break into their house previously. But he does tell the Gardaí that, look, we had heard that he was back in the area recently and he's done this before and that would be my guess. So he points the guards in the direction of this man and he names him. It's not just a random fake name that he's concocted. This is an actual real person and the guardie do go and follow up this lead and they interview this man who had absolutely just, you know, get this out of the way early on, had absolutely 
nothing to do with this. And Eamon also uses this interview as an opportunity to kind of put his theory forward on what might have happened in the lead up to him arriving home. And he says that, you know, well, Celine probably would have seen an intruder and Celine would have absolutely gone and confronted them because she was a tough cookie and Celine was a real fighter. Like, you know, she wouldn't have just backed down. She would have stood and fought. She would have fought back. She would have fought so hard with everything that she had in her. It's just the fighter that she was. And it makes the little hairs on the back of my neck stand up because if you haven't actually been there, you arrived on scene allegedly when your wife was already non-responsive, then you obviously don't know what happened. And this really emphatic speech about how Celine is such a fighter and, you know, if she had been attacked, she would have fought back with everything that she had. That's chilling. But they don't get a whole lot more than that story out of him. But he does call them. So Eamon calls the police the next day, the investigators. And he's just, you know, overnight, he's just remembered a few points that he had forgotten. He just wants investigators to to know there was a few other things he needs to add in there that he forgot to mention the day before when he was being interviewed, which red flag. (laughs) He forgot that he was unconscious for a while while this intruder was making his getaway. Anyway, moving on. The house, obviously, as you can imagine, was being combed over for evidence and they were going through not only the exterior, like the deck where this happened or the patio, they were going through the grass, they were going through the inside of the house, they were going around the exterior of the house, they were looking for anything and there was so much blood so not only was there the primary kind of pool of blood where they had found Celine where it had all gathered in that area but there was a separate area on the back patio where there had been you know blood spatter it looked like there had been some kind of a impact on a a human there in that area if you know what I mean And they had kind of a head-shaped blood imprint on one of the back windows of the house. So it really didn't look like it was just one area that someone was struck and went down. It looked like there was a pretty grisly fight that happened and it did absolutely look like Celine was fighting back. Now, what they didn't find was a single shred of forensic evidence that could be attributed to a third party intruder. There was not a fingerprint, not a fibre, not a hair, nada. What they did find inside the house though was even more interesting. So up in the master bedroom they found a pair of shoes, Eamon's shoes, put into his closet so just put away with the rest of his clothes and shoes and they had little bits of blood spatter on them so when they inspected them a little bit more closely, they had quite a lot of blood staining on the soles. Yeah, that was the first real, what the hell is going on here? They also then found a mobile phone on the bedside table, which it wasn't like a new up-to-date kind of phone, which we're in a three million, you know, quid house. We were dealing with some pretty wealthy people. So why does he have this kind of crappy phone on his bedside table? So it turned out it was more of a burner phone and when they looked through it, it had but one contact in it. And I'm sure that any <laughs> any of you are probably, you know, you're seeing where this is going. But next to the bed, there was also a little trash bin and in there, there was like some handwritten notes. I don't know what you want to call it, like a journal entry or a letter or just basic rambling, something that Eamon had written and discarded and it was along the lines of, you know, she's going to marry him. She will never share your bed. You will never see France together. You're running out of time. And there was no names. There was a reference to the letter K. It said, you know, she's going to marry K and they're going to send out their invitations soon. So yeah, super red flag. Okay, on top of the little burner phone with the one contact and the messages back and forth to that one person, some some gaps were starting to be filled very quickly. 
And then they moved up to the attic. So as I said, it was a very thorough comb over of the house. Like comb over, I can't believe I just said comb over. <laughs> but they go up to the attic and they're very thorough because they find a suitcase under loads of different boxes. And inside the suitcase, there's all these, you know, plastic bags and layers. And then they finally get, it's nearly like, you know, that pass the parcel game. They get right to the, the last layer and they find these bloody clothes, like men's clothes, right down to underwear. They find bloody towels, paper towels, bath towels, cloths, just basically a suitcase of horrors. And they know straight away this this guy, Eamon, he is full of shit. Now, I'm pretty sure that they suspected it because nothing that he was saying was adding up. But here was their smoking gun. And they're also at this point kind of retracing Eamon's steps that morning. They're looking at um, camera footage from the local shop where he went and bought his paper. They're trying to catch him on, you know, the road cameras. They're trying to make sure that the timeline of his day as he's put forward checks out. And they do find footage of him going in to buy his newspaper. But he's not wearing the clothes that he was wearing when he made the phone call and they brought them into the hospital. And you know, all the clothes that he removed and bagged for them as evidence, that they're not the clothes that he's wearing in this camera footage. The clothes in this camera footage actually look more like the bloody clothes that have just been found in the attic, hidden inside bags inside a suitcase. So it's now been a few days since this attack and since Celine has lost her life. And they're just coming up with more and more evidence against Eamon and then a phone call comes in and they get a tip off from a local beauty salon and they tell the police that they have an employee there by the name of Jean Tracy and that the police might want to talk to Jean Tracy because she's Celine's masseuse and she's also Eamon's masseuse. So yeah they do that they talk to this girl Jean Tracy and I'm not even going to insult your intelligence by, you know, trying to create some build up. But basically, Jean Tracy was having an affair with Eamon Lillis. She had originally known these guys by Celine being a client. Celine would come in every single week for a massage. It helped her release stress from her work week. And then Celine actually brought her husband in, Eamon, because Eamon was having back problems and Celine was trying to say to him, you know, you need to come and try this place. Go to my girl. She's really, really good at massage. And I'm sure it's going to help you with your back pain. So Celine brings her husband, Eamon, in, recommends her masseuse, Jean. And Jean starts an affair with Eamon. And the details of how this affair started and the accounts of, you know, who made the first move and how it progressed is just, it's too cringe. I don't even want to talk about it. It's icky. She was 31. She was engaged to someone called Keith. So there's your K. You know, it's all kind of slotting into place now. And it had started kind of at the beginning of October, I believe. And there was just, you know, a little bit of flirting. There was sexual tension. And then there was cringy, you know, things said in that massage room and she was putting his hand on her pulse and telling him, you know, you know, guess what I'm thinking about. It was just, it, yeah, icky, disgusting. Ew. We have a young girl doing a massage treatment on a wealthy man in Hoth. His wife comes to her for massage as well. And I mean, look at the guy, his picture. I'll put it up. It's not exactly like he's some kind of irresistible, tempting treat. But anyway, they actually bring it outside of the salon and they go and shag in the car. They go on drives together. They start going out and about and getting more ballsy and going into town together for the day. He's buying her, you know, nice presents and bringing her shopping. And then when Celine is out of the house and she's over in England with her daughter for the weekend, this little tramp is in Celine's house, in Celine's bed, and the scumbag of a husband who, let's be honest, has Celine to thank for his very nice surroundings and comfortable lifestyle is buying jewellery for this young one and bringing him into the family home that he shares not only with his wife but with his child. There's so many levels of wrong wrapped up in that. 
So at this point, the guards had more than enough to charge him. So they bring him in and they charge him with the murder of Celine Colley. He gets out on bail. He posts, I think it's like 75 grand of a bond and he gets to go home for Christmas. And I mean, I don't understand how murderers can get out on bail. Like, I know that you're innocent until proven guilty, but is there not certain crimes that you you really want to be keeping them in on remand? But anyway, he gets out for Christmas and the first thing he does is he sends jewellery to Jean for Christmas and she's still at first kind of standing by him and texting him back and forth and saying, you know, I'm here for you, nothing's changed with how I feel. But obviously this has all happened over a couple of days and by this point it is hitting the media. Shit is hitting the fan because it's no longer just a story about something really tragic and violent that's happened to a lady in Hoth and her husband is, you know, a suspect. Now news has broken about this affair. So Jean starts kind of sending a different type of message to Eamon and she wants to maybe distance herself she thinks it's better that he just focus on you know his daughter Georgia and everything he's got going on and for now it's better if they kind of just cool it and try and cut off contact for a little while and of course at this stage like Eamon has retained a solicitor like a criminal solicitor to defend him and of course what would any good solicitor do in in this case they would say don't say anything don't open your mouth do not speak I will be present with you and I will tell you when you can speak. But no, Eamon kind of doesn't feel like he needs to take that advice really when he's talking to the police. He's that arrogant that he feels like he can still fix it. You know, he can still explain this all away. And they've asked him at this point, you know, we found bloody clothes in the attic. We see you on a camera wearing them. How did these bloody clothes get from your body into the attic? And Eamon's like, (laughs) like maybe the burglars put them there because remember, he's still trying to say that these were burglars that came in and attacked his wife and he walked in on this and then they attacked him and ran away. But, oh wait, I just remembered I was unconscious so I didn't really see them get away. So yeah, (laughs) but he has at this point at least confessed to this affair. Now, he did say, he loved his wife very much and that he would have never left her. Now, do I believe he loved his wife very much? No, not at all. Do I believe he would have never left her? Part of me does because she had the money. So there was not really going to be a lot of incentive for him to walk away from that, let's just say. Especially, you know, if he's kind of gotten his mistress used to a certain level of lifestyle that he's not going to be able to provide on his salary. He's going to need to have Celine's money too. So I don't think that he was planning to walk away from his marriage. And they bring up, you know, the kind of discarded notes that they found in the little trash bin about this girl, she, she's going to marry Kay. She's going to send out wedding invitations. You'll never be with her. You're running out of time. And he basically tried to say, oh, I was just brainstorming for a potential project. You know, I might write a book after all. I mean, honestly, you can kind of see, you know, throughout this story why Eamon never really made it as a novelist because he really just can't tell a story very effectively. And I say that because he now is starting to abandon this original intruder story and he's going to give us a a new, different version. And this does not come out of the thin air. It happens for a reason. So do you remember I said Jean was trying to put distance between them and she was trying to cool the contact with Eamon? She didn't want to be tarred with this brush. Well, Eamon wasn't really dealing with that all too well. He was kind of, I'm not going to say stalking her, but he was following her and he was sending her letters at work. He was calling her constantly, trying to reach out to her in lots of different ways. He was sending gifts. Jean actually had left her job, which I don't blame her. I don't see how she could have continued working there, but she went and she worked somewhere else and he found the new place that she was working and started sending gifts and love letters there. So massive line crossed, especially given the fact that he's actually waiting for a trial and he's going to be facing some murder charges. 
So he's absolutely not showing any kind of self-preservation in this moment. He's a loose cannon. He's more concerned about Jean talking to him and, you know, making good with him than the fact that he's facing murder for his wife and, you know, his daughter's life has just fallen apart. No, no, no. It's all about Jean. So Jean goes to the police and she tells them, listen, he's been a little bit intense. He's not taken this breakup, if you like. I can't really call it a breakup. Like, he's not taking the distance very well. And he sent me this present. And obviously, at this point, it's very clear that Jean is going to be a witness in this trial. She's going to be a very crucial witness in this trial. So the judge drags Eamon in and gives him a spanking and basically says, leave her alone. She is a witness. You don't talk to her. But when Jean does come forward and she speaks to the police, in addition to kind of telling them what's been going on and what's been worrying her with Eamon, she also tells them that he gave her a version of events of what happened between him and Celine on that fateful morning in December. And it doesn't really align with what Eamon has told the police. Eamon has told Jean that on the morning of the 15th of December, Eamon and Celine were both in the house and they got into this massive fight that started out of nothing. So Eamon was meant to have put bird feed out for the birds. You know, it's winter time. It's nice to give, you know, a, a bit of sustenance out to the nice little robins that sing in your garden. But he never did it. And Celine started going off on him and telling him that he's useless and that he, she can't trust him to do anything. And it just kind of escalated and somehow they ended up outside. Despite the fact that it's December, it's Ireland, it's fucking Baltic, it's so cold. But they're both outside having this argument. And Celine slips on the patio and she hits her head on a brick that's on the ground when she slips. But she gets back up and they continue arguing and it gets physical between them and he pushes her and she hits her head on the window and then she kind of lunges at him and he slips and then she bites his finger. It just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't add up. I can't picture it. And you know, if Judge Judy says it doesn't make sense, it's not true. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand what happened here, but this is what he's told Jean and Jean didn't really buy it either, but she didn't come forward immediately with this information, which I find questionable. She only came forward with this information when she started to get the creeps from Eamon. And they talk to Eamon about this version and he kind of drops the act with the whole intruder business and he says okay fine there was no intruder but what actually happened was we were out on the patio and she was berating me and we got a bit you know heated and it turned physical but you know I, I kind of shoved her backwards she hit her head on the window and then I slipped and she slipped and it just seems like they were all over the place slipping like some kind of Laurel and Hardy movie and at some point, Celine had hit her head very, very hard on a brick that was kind of on the edge of the patio. And although, you know, it didn't knock her unconscious, she was quite dazed. But according to Eamon, she was sitting up and she was talking and they were saying, you know, how are we going to explain this? You know, we both have injuries. We need to not let our daughter Georgia know that this has happened because it would be so traumatic if she thought that we were getting into any kind of a physical altercation. So maybe we should make up a burglary. Maybe we should stage a burglary for the benefit of our daughter so that our daughter will come home and think that we've just been burgled and attacked in our own home. And that will be less traumatic for her than thinking that we've gotten into an argument. Now, I have no idea what kind of a brain thinks that this seems plausible but Eamon apparently does and this is the story that he kind of sticks to this is the hill he decides to die on no pun intended but he basically says well look we came to the agreement that we were going to stage a burglary and we were going to say that's what's happened here there was no physical fight between mommy and daddy so he leaves Celine, according to him sitting on the patio 
in freezing cold December, you know, as you do. And he goes inside to wash his hands and take off the clothes that he was wearing and hide them up in the attic. So he's admitted that he now is the one who hid these clothes up in the attic. And he's starting to think, how can I make this look like a burglary? But then about 15 minutes later, he goes down to check on Celine because he's he's cooled off now. Maybe they can make up. And Celine is basically non-responsive on the patio. So she's slipped out of consciousness in those 15 minutes. And that's when he calls the police. According to him, I just want to emphasize that. According to him, I do not buy a single word of any of this. And the pathologist at the trial didn't buy any of this because they could see that there was three blunt force traumas to Celine's head. And the way that she had fallen, it looked like that she was struck from the front first, fell face down or kind of slightly on her side. And then she was struck a further two times by a blunt object on the back of her head. And her death was a combination of blunt force trauma and like substantial blood loss so yeah it it really doesn't fit with the bullshit that he was trying to peddle does it and the other thing that they note is that her body temperature even though she was only pronounced dead when she got to the hospital Celine's body temperature was far below what it should have been had she been out in the back garden for the length of time that Eamon was trying to say that she was. And are we ready for the part of the story where we all get really, really mad? Okay, deep breaths. Let's let's pull the plaster off together. So it goes to trial and it is clear as day that Eamon has done this and that we have not been given the truth. And I, like at this stage, we're never going to know the truth of what happened. We're really not. But he's admitted some parts. He's lied about the majority. Jean has gotten up and testified against him. The pathologist has given a very damning testimony. And a neighbour also testifies that she heard screaming twice. Now, why on earth would you not report that? But anyway, that's another, like, that's just a minor, a minor query compared to all the other ones that I have. So Eamon is convicted, but he's convicted not of murder. He is convicted of manslaughter. Which basically means he did cause the end of someone's life, but it it wasn't his intention to end their life. They weren't able to prove intention. So the jury wasn't unanimous. It was kind of, I think it was 10 to 2. And he got manslaughter as a result. So the sentence that he was given, okay, deep breaths again, friends. (laughs) He was given a sentence of 6 years and 11 months. So just under 7 years. And he served five of those years. Yeah, he served five years. Now, I could probably, I could probably hypothetically have gotten on board if there was some kind of story being peddled that, you know, there was this huge financial imbalance and she was, you know, the way powerful women like Celine, you know, who Celine was known to be quite assertive and quite aggressive and quite a go-getter. You know, he could have leaned into that narrative and she was berating me. I was provoked. Like we saw provocation, provocation, excuse me, I can't say that word, provocation work yesterday for the Mulhall sisters. Well, for one of them, we saw that work for Linda Mulhall. But here we have this guy who the best story that he can come up with is that my wife and I got into an argument over bird seed and I loved her. We were a happy couple, but she just slipped and she hit her head off this brick like two or three times. And the fact that I was having an affair with a 31 year old masseuse down the road who's about to send out wedding invitations, you know, and get married to this other guy, had nothing to do with it. Absolutely irrelevant to what happened. So yeah, I just, the manslaughter verdict really irritates me. But Not just that, as I said, you're going to get really angry because apart from getting manslaughter and only serving five years, he came out of prison a millionaire. Because remember at the very, very beginning of this story, I said that everything wasn't just in Celine's name, even though she was, you know, the main earner, the biggest breadwinner in this household. It wasn't just a case of everything's in her name and he has a credit card and a little salary to tide him over. No, the company was a 50-50 shareholding. 
the homes that they owned. So they had three homes. They had the one that they lived in in Hoth, which was worth about three million. They had one in a neighboring village that was kind of an investment property. They would rent it out to make some passive income. And they had a home, a holiday home in France. They were all jointly owned. On top of that, they had huge pension funds that were 50-50. They were jointly owned. They had all their accounts jointly owned. And the list just goes on. And if everything had have been Celine's, let's just say, if it had have all been in Celine's name, and even if she had left it everything to her husband in her will, had that been the case, he would not have benefited at all financially. It would have bypassed him because of, you know, the Slayer Statute. Now, it's not called the Slayer Statute here. It's called the Slayer Statute, I think, in the US. But you get the gist. You're not going to financially benefit from killing someone else. Like, if they've left you everything in their will, you can't just run them over with your car and go, great, payday for me. No, it doesn't work like that. However, in law here, if things are jointly owned, then you are entitled to your half because half of that is yours. You're not inheriting that per se. It was yours always. So before Eamon goes to prison, he completely winds up Toy Town Productions Company, Celine's baby, and it's 50-50 shareholding. So 50% of it will go to Celine's estate. It's going to completely bypass Eamon but the other 50% is Eamon's free and clear. So he got about 350 grand from that. He was able to sell the investment property that he had in a neighboring village, 50% of that in his back pocket. And he also got to leave prison and go back to the home in Hoth that he murdered Celine in. And Georgia had been staying here this whole time. So Georgia, obviously she had family nearby, but Georgia had stayed in this family home and, you know, people would come in and they would be there with her. It wasn't like she was a 16, 17 year old kid living alone. But at this stage, Georgia was over the age of 18. So she was in this home. But now we have Eamon coming out of prison. Yes, because he's he's off living his life. He's long out of prison. And he decides, I'm going to sell this house in Hoth. And at this stage, the financial crash had completely just annihilated their market value. And as well, you know, the murder house discount. So the property that was worth 3 million only sold for about 850 grand. So he got half of that in his back pocket. And then the pensions and the current accounts and the savings accounts, everything that was 50-50, he got his cut. So Eamon Lillis basically killed his wife, did five years of time, and then came out, liquidated everything, and he was a millionaire. So yeah, what the actual fuck, guys? What the actual fuck? And he went to England for a while to kind of get out of Dodge. He stayed with his sister. And then he came back to Ireland. He actually bought a house not far from Hoth. It was in a place called Clontarf, I believe, which is also very swanky and expensive. But now he's left Ireland for good. And the last kind of articles, I was looking them up today, the last kind of articles are just, he's off living his life. He reconnected with a childhood sweetheart. So he's in a loving, committed relationship with this childhood sweetheart that he's known since he was in school. And he does some graphic design, I believe, as, you know, his main job. And he's just getting his happily ever after. And yeah, I just, there's something so unsettling about that. There's something for whoever that woman is, who was his childhood sweetheart, who reconnected with Eamon after he bludgeoned his wife, did time for said bludgeoning and even the mistress that he was off gallivanting with wanted nothing to do with him because he turned into a feckin creep and can we just take a moment to give a public service announcement to you know men and women everywhere when looking for love murder is a red flag if you're reconnecting with someone after a long time or you're dating someone maybe completely new but you find that they've done time for bludgeoning a spouse Maybe just take some time to work on yourself, you know? Maybe just take up arts and crafts. There are so many fish in the sea. The very least you deserve is a non-murdery fish. So that is today's case. That is our double bill of Dublin-based murders. We will be back next weekend for some more criminal spud and then we'll be back on Monday for Married at First Sight Australia. So that is it for the weekend, guys. Have a lovely Sunday evening and I will chat to you again very soon. Sweet dreams.